All right, good evening, Dito. Good evening. Hey, good evening, Anton. Yeah, we have a very special show today. This is our 10th episode of Tuesdays with Dr. J. Lo. And uh, tonight, we're talking about COVID-19, how to defend and fight um, on the first day of MECQ. And um, we're also giving away the for a glucose meter. Maybe can you share with us why it's the most accurate glucose meter in the market today? Okay, so just to uh, just to uh, tell everyone that the uh, GD40 is um, for us uh, state of the art uh, state of the art glucometer because it has the most important feature of the hematocrit ranges. This means that it can be used by a wide range of users. So different patient types have different hematocrit levels which affects the glucose measurement in glucometers. So with the GD40's wide hematocrit range, you are sure that the measurement is accurate regardless of patient type. So yes. there. And so we're, we're giving, giving away... away uh, correct. Please. Sir. So we're giving away a GD40 at the end of the show to, uh, to uh, those who are will leave comments on the chat box saying that uh, why they need the GD40 and why it is the best uh, best glucometer in the market. So we're giving that away at the end of the show. All right. Thanks. So kailangan lang nila mag-comment, no? During yes, this correct. actual live stream. Correct, correct. <clears throat> or actually, even if if uh, we can select from the, the ones who are on the live, but we'll just send them back a message. Maybe we can do that too. Okay. All right. So if you have family and friends who wants to listen to this very special episode on COVID-19, tune in to Juice Taste with Dr. J.Lo. All right. Dito, good evening, Dr. J. Lo. Good evening, good evening, Doc. Good evening, guys. Good evening. Good evening, everyone. Yeah, Doc, are you ready for this topic? Very timely. Uh, uh, kind of. Very <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we'll answer all the questions. Dr. J. Lo will answer all the questions related to COVID-19. And if anyone in the audience can or uh, has something to contribute, maybe they could uh, speak up, right? Can we do that? Yeah, of course, of course. Uh, yeah. Please uh, feel free to join our discussion. So um, as usual, we'll start off with a short presentation uh, from Dr. J. Lo, and then we'll open a Q&A. Uh, I actually have a lot of questions. I'm sure you, Dito, has a lot of questions also. So let's start. Maybe you can share screen. No. <clears throat> All right. Yes, yeah, so before we begin, uh, I'll be discussing just the basics of the immune system. So uh, basically our immune system is, our, is the mechanism that we use to fight off against not just infections, but also toxins as well as tumors. So uh, among the infections that we fight against include uh, bacteria, viruses, fungus, parasites, and um, with other germs. Yeah, so primarily all those. And then um, it's basically divided into innate immunity and adaptive immunity. So innate immunity is something that we're born with and it consists primarily of, um, of physical barriers, including the epithelium and mucous membranes, as well as chemicals in the body, such as those found in your digestive enzymes, uh, the stomach, as well as um, your tears, and then it consists of something called a complement system, and then other uh, cells, including neutrophils or uh, polymorphonucleotides and antigen presenting cells, and that includes uh, natural killer cells and macrophages. And then uh, the adaptive immunity is something that develops after birth, and it's a more of a delayed response, and it's primarily um, uh, headed by the lymphocytes, which are further divided into T cells and B cells. 
And of course, the T cells are subdivided further into uh, cytotoxic and helper cells. And the B cells are the, are the cells that actually produce antibodies. So this is just a comparison between innate versus adaptive immunity. And so uh, we begin first with the 10 basic principles for building immune health. Because uh, when people think about immune health, they just think about supplements to take, but there is more to taking supplements uh, when you talk about improving your immune system. So uh, they consist of the following. So initially, uh, or first off, with creating a commensal friendly environment. Secondly, maintaining appropriate hygiene practices. Third, avoiding antigens and allergens, especially during adulthood. Uh, fourth, building micronutrient and antioxidant reserve. Then maintaining and building cellular energy. Then there's uh, maintaining adequate detoxification capacity, diminishing stress and cortisol induced immune suppression, reducing chronic inflammatory triggers or mediators then using immune modulating agents to create balance and strengthen immune function, and finally maintaining and protecting barrier functions. So, uh, Dr. Jovel, uh, yes. is there uh, like uh, the most important among the 10 or are they all balanced? Uh, yeah, they're all, yeah, they're all equally important. If uh, something is amiss, then it could actually affect the whole, how the whole uh, system functions. Yeah, and um, if you want to have superior immune health, you want to make sure that you're paying attention to all these things. Um, so let's start with maintaining and protecting barrier functions. So most immune cells are found within specialized mucosal membranes that make up the GI tract, respiratory tract, genitourinary tract, and the lungs, generally known as the MALT or mucosa-associated lymphoid tissue and this, the largest portion of this is the gut, gut or gut associated lymphoid tissue, where it is said greater than 75 of all mature immune cells reside and function. So it's really important to make sure that um, the lining of, um, the, of uh, certain organs are working properly. Uh, otherwise, it could lead to problems with our immune system. So and that's just, just, yeah. So just to clarify, you're talking about the gut. Uh, parang the stomach area and, and until the yeah the basically the mucous membranes which are like epith epithelial tissue that lines your uh, gut as well as the respiratory tract re genitourinary tract as well as the lungs okay yeah okay so secondly is creating a commensal friendly environment and this support mechanism is closely related with barrier function, as friendly commensal organisms reside almost exclusively in the skin or mucos, mucosal membranes. So an environment that allows for the proper number and type of commensal organisms and is unfriendly to most harmful air organisms is important for overall health and vital for proper immune function. Because so much of the immune system resides in the GI tract, the training and maturation of immune system cells is dependent on the interaction with commensal organisms within the gut microbiota. So it's really important to pay attention to the uh, natural flora that inhabit our gastrointestinal tract. Uh, it's really important because uh, some of these cells actually produce antibodies or antimicrobial uh, substances that fight off har harmful organisms. Uh, feel free to butt in if you have any questions. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. um, so <clears throat> just wanted to understand that. So this yeah. is the gut, na, the, yeah. And yeah, you exactly. were saying you have to eat a lot of fermented foods, diba? Uh, yeah, that food. one, and also probiotics and something we call prebiotics, which are actually substances that feed the good bacteria in our in our in, in our intestinal tract. Uh, and just to let you know that uh, the normal flora is also found not only in your gut, but also in your skin and other parts of the body. Okay. Wow. So maintaining appropriate hygiene practices. 
So in the historic battle between human health and infectious diseases stand the appropriate role of personal and community hygiene practices. Changes in personal hygiene practices, water and sewage facilities, quarantine of infectious individuals and similar practices have saved countless lives. Where these practices are less common throughout developing nations, infectious diseases are still common and devastating. So uh, sanitation has a big role and also in our uh, improving our immune system. So those in third world countries are more prone to develop infectious diseases because of the lack of sanitation, basically. Then it's, it's also important to avoid antigens and allergens, especially during adulthood. So this advice appears basic, but it is fundamentally associated with the phenomenon of immune system aging known as immunosenescence. So basically our immune system ages as well. And as we age, our immune system appears to be less able to adapt new strategies when encountering new antigens. And it appears to be more vulnerable to immune related disorders. The elderly seem to be especially vulnerable to seasonal infectious agents, chronic inflammatory diseases, and of course, malignantly transformed cells not removed by the immune system before multiplying. So as part of aging, our immune system health begin to decline as well. So that's the gist of this, uh, this slide. And what's the age uh, that uh, it deteriorates? Yeah, well, everybody ages differently. So some people have premature aging and um, accompanying that is a decline in their immune system health. So if you want to have, if you want to health uh, well, um, like to age well and have a healthy immune system, you want to make sure that you're paying attention to your diet and lifestyle. Doc, so what fast forwards that decline in the in aging, I mean, in your uh, immune system? Well, there are different things that could decline. For instance, the number of your, uh, the production of your cells could begin to decline because there's also a limit in the um, stem cells in our body. So if those begin to decline, then our immune system uh, uh, also declines. Okay. Got it? Got it. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, and also, like for instance, if you take antibiotics, it would actually wipe out the good bacteria in your gut. And when you wipe that out, there's less production of B vitamins and antimicrobial substances, which are also important for immune system health. Uh, and by the way, certain medications, such as the one that press acid formation, could also affect your immune system. Because uh, when you have a decline in stomach acid, it's easier to uh, get um, affected by uh, microbes that you get through the, through the food that you eat. Okay. Okay. So uh, building micronutrient and antioxidant reserve. One of the hallmarks of modern nutrition is the connection between specific nutrient deficiencies and disease susceptibility. So no one questions that when we are truly deficient in one or more vitamin or mineral, we have reduced capacity to fight off various diseases. However, the notion that there is a continuum between micronutrient deficiency on one end and optimal immune enhancing levels of micronutrient intake on the other is often underappreciated. So a lot of these micronutrients, for instance, zinc. Zinc is a very common deficiency and zinc is involved in like 300 metabolic processes in the body. It's important for immune system health, for metabolic health, for blood sugar health, even uh, a hormonal health. So um, just a missing nutrient could affect a lot of uh, processes in the body. So to fight COVID, we need a lot of zinc. Uh, what's that, Anuba? What's your what's yeah. that recommended dose? Yeah, zinc is a very important nutrient that could, have, that could actually affect the replication of um, the COVID-19 uh, or the SARS-CoV-2 virus. And usually I would recommend like 40 to 50 milligrams of elemental zinc, but I'm gonna discuss those specifics uh, later. Okay. Yeah. Right. Um, so it's important to maintain and build cellular or mitochondrial energy. When the immune system is under attack, every bit of the metabolic reserve available for energy can be quickly depleted, leaving the patient exhausted and even lethargic, which is part of the classic illness syndrome. So notice, 
people who are, um, let's say, who, who have any type of sick sickness, including the flu, they're really tired and exhausted. So when our cellular energy reserves are depleted due to poor diet, stress, strenuous exercise, short sleep duration, or to perform other critical metabolic functions such as detoxification, our immune system can be easily overwhelmed. In addition, recent studies have shown mitochondria are critical to the function of both the innate and adaptive immune system, participating in antiviral signaling and antibacterial activities. So when we think about um, let's say the white blood cells, which is part of our immune system, uh, for it to be active, it needs energy. And people, uh, most people don't think that way. Uh, where, this, where do these uh, white blood cells get their energy from? So it comes from basically our diet. And if it's not um, from the diet, you could actually get it from uh, in the form of supplements, like for instance, CoQ10 or um, things like, um, L-carnitine could help improve your uh, energy or the ATP levels, which would ultimately uh, affect your uh, white blood cell activity. Okay. Yeah. Good. That's clear, no? <laughs> okay. So maintaining adequate detoxification capacity. So an important area of metabolic reserve that directly affects, affects immune uh, or impacts immune function is liver function and more specifically detoxification capacity. When liver function and detoxification capacity are functioning appropriately, removing endogenous and exogenous toxins are significant burdens removed from internal immune and GI functions. However, slow or incomplete detoxification allows for cell damage and GI irritation that exacerbate immune system inflammatory responses deplete nutrient resources, and create opportunities for additional immune-related uh, vulnerabilities. So it's important that the um, detoxification function is working optimally. Otherwise, our immune system has to deal with a lot more things rather than just focus on, let's say, getting rid of toxins, tumors, or infectious agents. And how would you know that, Doc? Uh, if you're, uh, if you have a sluggish uh, uh, detoxification mm -hmm. capacity, uh, yeah. sometimes it may show up through uh, your blood tests uh, or people who have, let's say, uh, problems with uh, constipation, people who have uh, headaches or skin conditions. These are people who usually have uh, problems with detoxification. But uh, if you want specific tests for uh, detoxification, there are functional tests actually available. Uh, it could be done by functional labs, but um, unfortunately they're not available in the Philippines as of yet. So we would still have to send this specimen samples to the US to see how uh, this detoxification capacity of your liver, for instance, is functioning. Okay. Yeah. All right. So stress and cortisol also induce immune suppression. Stress in general and cortisol specifically is a powerful inhibitor of the innate immune response. Cortisol is known as one of the most potent endogenous anti-inflammatory molecules, whereas inflammatory mediators such as IL-6 and tumor necrosis factor alpha are strong triggers of the HPA axis. So uh, when you're under a lot of stress, it acts it would actually suppress your uh, immune system. So it's important to be able to, um, to deal with stress uh, productively. Otherwise, um, the stress hormone cortisol, cortisol could actually wreak havoc to our uh, immune system. Okay. Um, uh, then there's chronic or uh, reducing chronic inflammatory triggers or mediators. So inflammation is one of the core functions of the immu innate immune system and is vital to a healthy immune response. However, inappropriate or chronic inflammatory signaling is a hallmark of almost every chronic disease. And the appropriate modulation of inflammation is critical for a healthy immune system. So you guys heard of like cytokine storms. Basically, it's how our body has an exaggerated immune response to infections. And that's basically one of the underlying um, uh, mechanisms in, the, in, the, in SARS-CoV-2. 
uh, basically having a cytokine storm, which causes further damage to our bodies. That's where immunomodulators such as vitamin D and melatonin comes in. So those uh, modulate or balance your immune system. Basically an immune modulator uh, balances uh, your immune system. If it's too active, it lowers it. If it's too low, it uh, raises it. Okay. Um, so using immune modulating agents to create balance and strengthen immune function. So while well, the foundation of immune support is building metabolic reserve, there are a number of ways to specifically enhance immune functions using agents generally referred as, uh, to as um, immune modulators. These agents vary in their mechanisms, but are mostly derived from plants or fungi. Some of these agents are antimicrobial, antiviral, antifungal, or antiparasitics, while other agents act to stimulate or modulate immune cell function. Okay, um, Doc, my question. Yeah. Um, see, Andrew, is there any way to check our level of immunity? How can we know that our immune system is good? Are there quantitative markers for early detection and monitoring? Yeah, I'll be getting to that. However, uh, a simple way to check if your immune system is working properly is through the CBC or complete blood count. So with, um, with a white blood cell, uh, you could tell qualitatively or quantitatively through the CBC if you have enough uh, white blood cells, which is also important for immune system. And there is another um, way to check how your white blood cells are functioning, and that's through the live blood cell microscopy. Uh, that would see how active our white blood cells are. If it's sluggish, then um, that could lead to problems. But there are other tests uh, that you could use to check for immunity. Uh, let me see if I could get to that. Uh, I think I could discuss those a little bit later. Okay. All right, Doc. Okay. Um, so uh, factors affecting immunity. So chronic sleep deprivation. So ideally, you need to have regular sleep, uh, okay. 79 hours, ideally, because uh, uh, during the sleep, um, uh, the process of sleep, we actually produce a hormone called melatonin. It's a hormone produced by your pineal gland, and it's actually not only important for sleep, but it's also an antioxidant as well as an immune modulator. So uh, people who are not having enough sleep could have lowered immune systems. Second is a lack of physical exercise. So uh, to correct this, we need regular and varied physical exercise, ideally 30 minutes each day. And that's a combination of aerobic exercise and weight training. And it also says that uh, regular sex is also associated with higher immu immunoglobulin A levels in the saliva. That's also part of the immune system. Oh. <laughs> then, of course, poor diet also impairs the immune system. So to be able to improve your uh, immune system, you need to have adequate but not excessive energy supply. And there should be optimal intake of micronutrients particularly vitamins A, D, B6, zinc, and selenium, and optimal intake of antioxidants such as vitamin C. Um, then there's chronic stress um, that also suppresses the immune system. And what you do is uh, improve that through several ways such as deep breathing exercises, sufficient rest and relaxation, meditation, relaxing music. Some people do exercise as a form of uh, stress management. And some people do online shopping nowadays. <laughs> <laughs> Doc, uh, my question lang since yeah. Yeah. Um, we always hear immuno, uh, immunocompromised people. What does it exactly mean? Uh, those people have lowered immune system. They're more prone to get uh, infections. So these are people who actually are sick all the time, and um, basically they uh, they have lowered immune systems, mm -hmm. so that uh, you compromise. But you also see this in people who have uh, who are taking certain uh, uh, medications, uh, like for instance steroids that could actually 
make a person immunocompromised. People who are taking uh, chemotherapeutic drugs uh, that could also make a person immunocompromised because some about, of these things could also how about destroy hypertensive drugs uh, for hypertension. Right. Yeah, some drugs could actually deplete the body of certain nutrients, and that's how it could compromise the immune system. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a, a lot of uh, drugs deplete the body of coenzyme Q10. That's why a lot of people may experience fatigue, and those others could also uh, have um, uh, a depletion of the B vitamins, particular B12 and folic acid. So that could also affect your energy level as well as immune system health. Yeah, most drugs actually deplete the body of certain nutrients. Then another immunity, immunity impairing factor includes lack of social contacts. So nowadays it's uh, quite common to have lack of social contacts because of the lockdown. Thank God for um, the internet. At least we're, we're still able to connect with family as well as friends. Uh, frequent negative talk and talking to taking things too seriously uh, could also affect your immune system. So um, general fun and humor, frequent laughing. Um, you guys have heard of Patch Adams, right? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. So when you laugh a lot, that actually raises your natural opioids or endorphins and encephalins. So these, um, the substances could actually help improve your immune system. So it's Are important right? to laugh, even at this time. After, after is the best yeah. medicine. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, travel, flying and changes of environment could also affect your immune system. So you wanna boost immunity before a flight by taking certain nutrients such as glutathione, vitamin C, zinc, course, sufficient hydration, take probiotics, and to recover from jet lag, uh, take some um, melatonin. Melatonin. Yeah. Alcohol, again, has, has an immune suppressive effect, so it's important to re reduce alcohol consumption. Avoid binge drinking, and if you decide to drink, um, try to drink more of red wine, which is rich in polyphenols including resveratrol, which has anti-aging properties. Then obesity could also suppress the immune system. So what you do is reduce abdominal obesity with an anti-inflammatory diet and exercise and make sure you get adequate sleep and stress management. Smoking, we don't need to <laughs> talk that, about that. And then there's dehydration um, that could also uh, suppress the immune system. So what you do is make sure that you get adequate hydration and you could actually compute for that. Like if you um, basically body weight in pounds and half of that in pounds, this would be your uh, optimal water intake. So if you weigh like 150 pounds, drink at least 75 ounces or more than two liters of water per day. Got that. Okay. Go to uh, any questions uh, regarding those? Ah, uh, no, it's okay. Yeah, no, no. I think it's clear. Yeah. yeah. All right. So, COVID <laughs> so we discussed COVID nineteen, which is a, a severe acute respiratory syndrome, coronavirus two. It's the cause of coronavirus disease twenty nineteen or twenty COVID twenty nineteen. So basically, this disease has spread pandemically around the world under severe stress. It's characterized by a broad spectrum of clinical syndromes. So some people are asymptomatic and some have mild influenza-like influenza symptoms and others have severe pneumonia and acute respiratory syndromes. It is common to observe the ability of a single virus to cause widely differing pathological manifestations in humans. This is often due to multiple contributing factors, including number one, size of the viral inoculum. Then second, the genetic background of the patient. Third, the presence of concomitant pathological conditions. And establish adaptive immunity towards closely related viruses or other microbes can reduce susceptibility or enhance disease severity. Basically, um, this slide says that um, not everybody would get sick from the virus. It depends on different factors. 
and um i believe that uh well it's in my um my facebook page actually but um uh, if you get a small size of the virus like a small size of the viral inoculum uh you don't need to get sick but if your immune system is slow um even a small size of the inoculum would actually uh cause illness so that's why some um some authorities re recommend the use of masks because if you let's say are exposed to someone who's coughing uh you won't be able to get a lot more of the uh, you don't get a lot of viral load uh that way it uh, the mask could actually help but it's important to um use the proper mask because some masks are actually useless um so doc, yeah. i have a super question sorry uh, um for people who are uh asymptomatic does that mean that they're actually uh that their immune system is in place that it's actually working well if yeah, for those who are not, yeah, for those who are not exhibiting symptoms but are supposed to be infected, um, it means that their body is able to fight off uh, the infection. That's why they're not exhibiting symptoms. For those who have poor immune systems, usually they're the ones who begin to uh, exhibit symptoms. But um, let's say uh, a person has mild symptoms, that means the, um, and usually those with mild to moderate symptoms are able to um, recover from the illness because of a uh, healthier immune system compared with those who have severe symptoms. Yeah, so uh, basically uh, there's a lot of factors that could actually contribute to illness. Uh, it's not just the infectious agent, but also the viral load or the size of the viral inoculum and the genetic background of the patient, basically um, how healthy the person is. And on the, here, the third one says the presence of concomitant pathological conditions. So for those with comorbidities, they're the ones who are more prone to uh, get sick from the virus. Uh, what does that exactly mean, um, Doc? Uh, particular diseases, you know. Yeah, like to say, we have different uh, susceptibilities. So if a person has a healthy immune system and they're exposed to a small load of the virus, then they don't get sick. But uh, let's say you get um, a big load of the virus, um, like a high viral load, um, you may develop an infection if your uh, immune system gets overwhelmed. Let's say you're not getting enough sleep. You're a lot. You're under a lot of stress. Then perhaps you may um, you may exhibit symptoms. So um, it's not like everybody would get sick because uh, if everybody did, then you would see higher numbers in the daily reports. Okay, my question, doc. Um, I heard from a few people that your blood type can also factor in how heavy hit some people are compared to others. Is there any truth in this? Um, well, because the COVID vi the COVID nineteen um, well the SARS CoV two virus is still relatively new. There's still a lot of like um, unverified information, but I all I already heard of that um, that theory that certain people with people with certain blood types are more uh, able to. Uh, resist the infection. I believe it's like type A and um, yeah, type A primarily, A and O, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. Yeah. So about to be validated. In, uh, yeah, uh, there's still a lot of things up in the air. Uh, and that's because, again, this virus is relatively new and we're still discovering uh, a lot of things about it. Um, so SARS-CoV-2 belongs to Corona viridae, a family of large RNA viruses infecting many animal species. species. So six other coronaviruses are known to infect humans. Four of them are endemically transmitted and cause the common cold. While SARS-CoV-2 and SARS-CoV-1 and MERS-CoV 
have caused limited epidemics of severe pneumonia. All of them trigger antibody and T cell responses in infected patients. However, antibody levels tend to wane faster than T cells. So they tend to drop faster compared to your T cells, T memory cells. So SARS-CoV specific antibodies drop below the detection limit within two to three years. Whereas SARS-CoV specific memory T cells have been detected 11 years after infection. And that's why some people are more uh, resistant to SARS-CoV-2 because of this uh, T cells, which is not talked about that much compared to your antibodies. So uh, what does it mean, Doc, the T cells? How can yeah, I... The T cells is part of your uh, cell-mediated immunity. So when you have an infection, basically your T cells um, get activated. So uh, once you get another infection, your body would recognize it um, like uh, more quickly. Uh, so uh, compared to antibodies, it doesn't uh, drop uh, like um, it doesn't drop faster. Um, like I mentioned here, antibodies to uh, certain viruses wane within one within two to three years. So by the second or third year, sometimes you can't detect it in the blood. But when you check for the T memory cells, you still have this. Uh, you still have this um, component of your immune system working against that specific uh, virus. Okay. Um, doc, uh, you mentioned mask. Uh, kanina. Yeah. Uh, may related question, eh, si Rabi. A lot of people selling masks out there, some for fashion. What materials must we look for to make sure the mask is good and filters the virus? How many layers should be? What fabric must it have? Yeah, I'm not an expert in mask. However, the cloth masks are useless because uh, the virus is, uh, the viral size is actually smaller than the pores of this cloth mask. So if you're gonna wear a cloth mask, Ideally, you should wear it over a surgical mask for double protection. And then this, um, some of these surgical masks may not be as effective. In fact, the boxes actually warn you that they're not effective against uh, certain viruses. And this mask are actually used by the wearer to uh, protect others, basically, and it doesn't really protect themselves. But um, again, when you think about viral load, let's say you're around someone who's coughing, it's better to have a mask on because you will not get as much um, viral load if you're wearing a mask compared to uh, when you're not wearing one. Uh, so the most effective so, so one would be the, the most effective one would be the N95. But a lot of people are having trouble breathing with this with this N95s, uh, with this N95 mask. But some people are able to tolerate it. Um, a tip I give some of my clients who are uh, wearing cloth masks is to put like essential oils because some of these essential oils have anti um, antiviral properties. So you could put it over your mask as a as an added protection. Which oil in particular? Uh, there are different oils with uh, antimicrobial properties. For instance, thyme, lemon, frankincense, uh, peppermint. Um, right. Yeah, th these are just some of the oils that have antimicrobial properties. Uh, there is actually also oil of oregano, but that one could sting. So uh, <laughs> I'm... I, I just want to give a warning for those uh, people who apply essential oils on their mask. Some of them could burn um, if they're applied uh, like uh, without Much. any, um, what do you call this, carrier oil. Uh -oh. Doc, okay. how about the masks with the vents or the uh, like those exhaust, fan, exhaust fans? <laughs> yeah, there's still some controversy regarding those uh, vents. Um, but I haven't read much about it uh, yet. 
Okay. Uh, may follow-up question. Citronella, kasama ba yan? Can, can it kill virus? Um, citronella, uh, well, they use primarily against um, mosquitoes that carry the dengue uh, virus. Um, it may help, I believe. Um, yeah. Okay. All right. Let's continue. Yeah, so um, hold on a second. So these are some of the um, uh, tests that, um, yeah, the, that uh, could be run um, to see how, per, how a person's immune system is functioning. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, uh, CBC, a complete blood count, could show leukopenia or lo low white blood cells in a person who's... Uh, um, possibly infected with um, SARS-CoV-2. Uh, complete metabolic panel, sometimes their uh, ALT or AST, those are liver function tests could be elevated. Uh, Procalcitonin uh, may be low or normal. Then um, other tests include a CRP, which may be uh, elevated. That's an inflammatory marker, D-dimer, uh, LDH, PTINR, ferritin, those could all be ele elevated, creatinine kinase. Uh, so a lot of tests um, could be run to determine if there's, a, if there's an infection going on or if a person's immune system is uh, sluggish. Okay. There's another one. Have you heard of a C C3 complement? C3 complement 3? Yeah, that's a, uh, yeah. Well, it's an immune system test to see if your body is capable of battling bacteria and viral infections. Because you mentioned about the FRCRP and the D-dimer. The D-dimer yeah. naman is for blood, blood clot detection, no, Doc? Mm-hmm. Uh, why yeah, is that important? What? Yeah, Sorry, one of doc. The that, yeah, one of the ways that the SARS-CoV... Uh, um, how well causes a uh, damage to the body is through the uh, clotting mechanism. Mm. So that's why it's important to check on those uh, things as well. Um, we have a question on what supplement to take. You'll uh, discuss that, right, Doc? Yeah, I'm gonna discuss this quickly. These are okay. some of the immune boosting berries and fruits before we go to the, some of the prescription meds that are being used. Um, so pomegranate, bilberry, and cranberry juice have polyphenols, which have anti-inflammatory properties. Cherries also reduce CRP and interleukin-6, so it's an anti-inflammatory too, often used in uh, cases of arthritis. Elderberries, uh, it's commonly used for uh, the common cold because of its antiviral effects. It also increases cytokine tumor necrosis factor alpha. Elderberries also are um, rich in zinc, just uh, FYI. And then uh, acai, which is rich in anthocyanins, also anti-inflammatory. Doc, lahat yan imported, no? Um, almost, yes. Almost, no. Yeah. Uh, then other immune system boosting plants, these ones are available locally, include uh, turmeric, which is also anti-inflammatory. Um, then there's ginger, which decreases oxidative stress. By the way, um, uh, this virus creates damage through excessive oxidative stress. So that's why it's important to take your antioxidants. Uh, ginger, in, uh, this is something that... Uh, is part of Filipino talk, folk tradition. That's the the use of talabat. So, uh, doc, yung oxy oximeter. That's really a helpful marker, ba, for COVID. Uh, well, the oximeter just tells your uh, oxygenation, your blood oxygenation. So, if that reaches a certain level, that means you're not getting enough oxygen in your blood. Uh, okay. Yeah. Um, immune system boosting medicinal plants include green tea, such as EGCG. 
EGCG, by the way, is a zinc ionophore, similar to the popular medication that we'll discuss later uh, called hydroxychloroquine. So this EGCG facilitates the entry of zinc into the cells where um, it does its job. Um, and of course, uh, green tea also has anti-inflammatory properties. Cacao also reduces CRP, so it's an anti-inflammatory too. A garlic, Ginseng and noto ginseng also are immune system boosting medicinal plants. Uh, echinacea, this is popularly used more on the in the Western Hemisphere, so it's um, usually used for the common cold. Then there's astragalus, which is a natural antibiotic, also a natural anti-inflammatory anti and antioxidants. Uh, immune boosting fats include extra virgin olive oil, reduces C-reactive protein and interleukin-6, omega-3 fatty acids also uh, have anti-inflammatory properties. Then there's extra virgin olive oil, which is rich in polyphenols. So all these are good in boosting your immune system. Okay. And of course, uh, vitamin C. Uh, most people think that it's just an antioxidant, but uh, it also has a lot of other properties. Um, normally, the RDA is only 75, 90, 75 milligrams per day in women and uh, 90 or 100 milligrams per day in men. So uh, that's not enough for it to work as an antiviral. You need to take really high doses as much as three to 10 grams per day orally and up to 10 to 50 grams per day intravenously. So um, before you do the, like really high doses of vitamin C, we also do testing. We have to make sure that, that your kidney function test is working, your kidney function uh, is working properly and that you don't have any G6PD deficiency. Doc, what are G6PD deficiencies? Yeah, this is uh, something that occurs in some people. Uh, These people are don't react well to high doses of certain... Uh, uh, they don't react well to high doses of antioxidants. Okay. All right. Immune boosting. So other immune boosting uh, dietary supplements, there's vitamin B1, magnesium, and creatine, um, vitamin B3, so there's a mechanism of action. CoQ10, by improving energy, helps your, um, your white blood cells and macrophages, nat natural killer cells, to become more active. And uh, other immune system uh, dietary supplements include L-lysine. Um, we use this primarily for herpes simplex virus infection. Uh, and also, um, there's alpha lipoic acid, glutathione, and N acetylcysteine. Uh, glutathione is the most uh, abundant endogenous antioxidant in the body, by the way. Then, of course, there's probiotics. Uh, probiotics, they help in the production of uh, antimicrobial substances. So that's why it's really important to take probiotics after a course of antibiotics. So uh, then there's uh, finally uh, vitamin D. Um, vitamin D normally is produced through uh, sun exposure. Uh, when you have enough vitamin D, you actually produce CAMPs. These are catholicidin antimicrobial peptides. So if your levels are low, you don't produce enough of this antimicrobial peptides, making you more prone to infections. Um, vitamin D sources include sunlight, dietary supplements, fatty fish, and cod liver oil. Ideally, you should have um, optimal numbers. A lot of people are deficient in it because of, um, again, not enough sun ex exposure and also the use of, um, what do you call this, um, sunblocks. So they found out in studies uh, done on uh, COVID-19 that those who have really low levels of vitamin D are the ones who really get severe infections. 
Vitamin D, by the way, is an immune modulator. Aside from being a, a vitamin, it's also a pro-hormone. So, so this, uh, pardon me, sorry. <laughs> so you need to be in the sun uh, to go out of the sun. Yeah, Especially now we're all at home, right? Yeah, you could get some exposure, yeah. that'd be great. And this is a recent study done in Israel. Uh, vitamin D helps the body fight coronavirus. Uh, this is just a re recent study that came out, out of Israel. Then, uh, of course, there's zinc. Zinc is a um, mineral that prevents viral replication and translation. So this is the key um, nutrient that's missing in a lot of the studies that are being conducted against COVID-19. Because there are a lot of studies done in hospitals and as well as clinics, but uh, they only involve the use of medications and um, uh, they're not incorporating uh, zinc. And that's, that's the most important component of this protocol. Uh, as it says here, zinc is required for the function of more than 300 enzymes and more than 1,000 transcription factors. It acts in enzymatic reaction as a catalyst to accelerate the action of all these. And like I said, um, um, so these are uh, among the uh, functions of zinc. So it boosts immune defenses, breaks down and metabolizes proteins. It's also important for a healthy prostate. Uh, it's also important for your blood sugar. It enhances the biochemical actions of vitamin D, so they have synergistic properties. It's an essential component of hormones, essential for cell division and replication of both DNA and RNA. It has anti-inflammatory properties, helps with the absorption of vitamin A, uh, and more. So many, uh, so many benefits uh, from the use of zinc. And this is quite a very common nutritional deficiency we're not getting enough of it anymore. Uh, these are the top, uh, top 10 food sources of zinc, uh, fresh oysters, ginger root, and so on and so forth. Um, Doc, is there a preventive dose of zinc but, that you could take for to defend against COVID-19? Yeah, the protocol requires a 40 to 50 milligrams of elemental zinc. You could find that in 200 milligrams of zinc picolinate, as well as zinc uh, sulfate, um, 200 milligrams of either uh, zinc salts. And you can buy that in Mercury, or where do you buy that? Yeah, those are available probably at Mercury and some health food stores. And some compounding Doc. pharmacies also carry zinc. Okay. Doc, sorry. Uh, um, just, is there a difference between vitamin D and vitamin D3? Uh, when, I, when I talk about vitamin D, uh, D, it's primarily D3 form that I'm uh, referring to. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. So quercetin is a bioflavonoid. Uh, it's also an antihistamine anti and antioxidant, as well as an anti-inflammatory. This is the natural alternative to the medication uh, called hydroxychloroquine. What it does is that it works as a zinc ionophore. Uh, you can see it here. It was demonstrated to be a zinc ionophore back in 2014. So for those who are wary of taking drugs, or do not have access to this, the medication HCQ, they could actually take quercetin. Uh, it does um, work as a zinc ionophore, meaning it that facilitates the entry of zinc into the cells, which interferes with uh, viral replication and transcription. Uh, and what's the preventive dose for this? The dose I recommend is 500 milligrams twice a day on the quercetin. After and before eating or before eating seguro? No? With or without meals is okay with a quercetin. Okay. How about, yeah. how about food sources of quercetin, Doc? Yeah, food sources include like red apples and uh, onions, ginger, and... Um, uh, on my Facebook page, you could actually see the other sources of quercetin. I wasn't able to include those here. 
Uh, medicinal fungus. Uh, these are found to contain several substances that are likely to become more and more relevant in the treatment of illnesses and the development of new medicines. The uh, compounds actually kill bacteria and viruses. They also possess immunoregulatory properties. Um, some of these uh, medicinal mushrooms include maitake, shiitake, uh, cordyceps mushrooms. So other substances that are important for the immune system uh, include uh, collagen. So it's not only good for the skin but also or connective tissue, but it's also important for immune system health. Uh, there's licorice, lactoferrin, and L-glutamine. And um, just to show you here uh, in this diagram, so um, people who have viral infections may have deficiencies in any of these nutrients. So they, um, I was able to uh, show you all these nutrients earlier, but uh, um, in summary, they would include vitamin A, D, C, um, amino acids such as cysteine, then there's glutathione, minerals such as selenium, copper, and zinc and other vitamins like vitamin B9 and E, and nutrients such as CoQ10. So all these could actually affect your, how our body um, um, fights against uh, viral infections. Uh, the mechanism of action is actually underneath each of so, uh, oh, those. Um, my uh, related question, or, or is that the last slide, right? You want to? My related question now. Uh, let's yeah. uh, uh, get this question. Um, from the presentation, I see a lot of supplements that we can take to boost the immune system, but realistically, an average person like us won't be able to consume what are the top five um, and then comment on hydroxychloroquine and zinc as a cure. Uh, what makes the combination effective? Yeah. Um, so... Yeah, the top five uh, supplements that I would recommend as a preventive as well as for treatment, uh, at least for mild or moderate cases, include vitamin C. Uh, you have to take um, optimal dose for it to work as an antiviral. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, three to 10 grams orally or 10 to 50 grams intravenously. Then there's vitamin D3 at 5,000 units per day after meals. Um, for those who have really low numbers, they may take 10,000 units of vitamin D per day. But if you take really high doses of D, you have to take it with vitamin K. Um, you do this because uh, when you take a lot of vitamin C, or D, I mean, you um, absorb a lot of calcium. And this calcium would go into soft tissues if there's not enough uh, vitamin K. So the vitamin K... Uh, guides the calcium to go where it's needed, and that's uh, the bones primarily. Uh, another one would be vitamin, uh, I mean zinc. Zinc, at least uh, 200 milligrams of zinc picolinate or sulfate. So the, uh, zinc is um, basically the mineral that has antiviral uh, properties. Um, it, all, it actually prevents the replication and transcription of viruses within the cell. Uh, the okay. next one would be uh, quercetin, which is the natural, which is the natural zinc ionophore. So it facilitates the entry of um, zinc into the cell, where it actually does its job. Okay, all right. Uh, doc, uh, may mga question pa. Um, parang na baba lang yung ano mo, camera mo doc. Okay, okay. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh, I can see palitan, you. Palitan. Pakibaba. Uh, oh. Yan, yan. Okay. Uh, how about cannabis oil, uh, CBD oil, sorry, to prevent infection? Um, good question. I don't have much information on CBD, but I know that it's an anti-inflammatory. And we have um, cannabinoid receptors in the body that modulates our immune system too. So there is a role for CBD in immune system health. But um, there is, uh, well, 
there's a lot of information, but um, as far as the legality or of uh, CBD in uh, certain countries, uh, it's still up in the air. So, wala pang uh, parang legislation uh, regarding uh, certain substances like CBD. Okay. Um, my question, uh, Christian Valdez, mask with vents. Is it true that although uh, it can prevent the virus to penetrate the mask? Oh. And, uh, um, if the user is infected already, the virus can escape through the vent. Tama ba yun, Doc? Um, I'm sorry, can you say that again? Hello? Hello? Sorry. Mask with vent. Is it true that although the, uh, it can prevent the virus to penetrate the mask and infect the user, if the user is infected already, the virus can escape through the vent? No? So, can you give me a minute? I need to really take this call. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, see, si, ikaw naman dito. <laughs> Wala ko alam dyan. But, um... <laughs> Uh, you know what I noticed, Anton? Parang uh, lahat ata nung napag-usapan natin is about, uh, you know, uh, boosting the immune system and then getting yourself in, uh, you know, get, getting yourself healthy, you know, with the proper wellness. Gut health is very important. I think oh, yung, uh, yung, uh, yung sinabi niya about probiotics and prebiotics, uh, you know, we should uh, really um, have a steady source of that, especially now, no? Uh, one thing that I want to ask see si Dr. J. Lewis, actually, how about those supplements uh, that are meant to to promote a healthy body pH? Because uh, I think what we notice is um, for patients who are infected with some or, or show some symptoms of uh, COVID, they're asked to uh, eat alkaline and rich, rich foods. Eh, diba? That's what you told me the other day. So ano kaya yung ano yan? I think we should ask that question also. And um, and then he said, no, I, I think he also mentioned about nutrition, boosting the immune system with nutrition, supplements, sleep, exercise, sunlight, and stress reduction. And um, I think and he also said that, uh, I think in one of his um, Facebook posts, that um, we should or at, at least the government should rethink the way they're actually, um, is it testing? Testing the, the testing for the virus. Because I think it should, it should be more like early monitoring and of the viral infection by way of the blood testing parameters that he mentioned earlier, like the D-dimer or the FRCRP and then the C3 complement. So those are the things. So, because clinical studies uh, state that with blood clotting, with for COVID patients, I think that's really um, it shows that uh, people on COVID, with COVID show blood clotting. Uh, doc, I took your show. Yeah, sorry about that. I had to really take that call. Meron may okay, sakit. No problem. <laughs> no problem. Um, let's. Take it away. Uh, Complete lang muna yung ano. Uh, mask with vent, is it true that although the it can prevent the virus to penetrate the mask and infect the user, if the user is infected already, the virus can escape through the vent. Is that true? Uh, I would think so. Okay. Kasi yeah. Um mm. Next, uh, is eating dark chocolate 70% and up good for boosting the immune system? Yes, it could help improve the immune system. Yeah. Um, pero wala siya sa list mo, Doc, no? So, ibig sabihin... Uh, that's, uh, that's cacao. So, that's uh, basically uh, chocolate. Okay. Um, and then, Doc, uh, maybe you can comment. Um, so, there's this document circling around the internet, no? Parang mm -hmm. um, ito yung advice from inside isolation hospitals. We can do at home. Parang vitamin C, E, egg, mm -hmm. Uh, and then yung alkala, uh, note that it's parang alkaline, more alkaline foods. Um, 
ito yung mga kinakain. So, maybe can you comment on alkalinity or pH level of the body? Is that yeah, very I'll be, I'll be uh, talking that uh, talking about that in a bit when I explain ah, okay. it in All right. Yeah. So, can I proceed with that? Yes, let's see. Doc, sorry. Yeah, so with HCQ, so this is how it works. So it's a very weak base. So um, before I explain how it works on uh, COVID, this is how it works on um, basically on malaria. So Plasmodium, Falciparum, and other species of, of, um, of malaria have this... Um, uh, what we call lysosome, uh, which is like the digestive system of the of the that um, protozoa. So what HCQ does in malaria is that it enters into this um, lysosome where it causes decreased acidity. So when you have decreased acidity, that would make your uh, this uh, basically this. Uh, organisms starve to death. So that's basically how it works in malaria. So, um, so this is our normal cell. We have the nucleus and other uh, what we call um, uh, microorganelles, or yeah, microorganelles, and that includes like uh, lysozymes, Golgi uh, apparatus, as well as the endoplasmic reticulum. Uh, we also have this uh, cell receptors. So this receptors is called ACE2, or angiotensin converting enzyme um, two. Uh, this is actually where the coronavirus attaches. So we have this spike proteins on the surface of this coronavirus. What is the, what it does is that it attaches to this ACE2 uh, receptors where it actually uh, cleaves. So one remains on the receptor area, or the ACE2, while the other actually uh, fuses with your cell membrane. You could see this red one here. So mm -hmm. once um, fusion happens, this RNA found within the um, virus actually is transported within or into the cell where it's acted upon by your enzyme, this RDRP, or um, RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. And when it's acted upon by this enzyme, you actually make viruses. So you produce viruses within the cell. Uh, HCQ, what it does is that it basically enters into the cell where, uh, as a weak base, it makes the um, environment here less acidic. So um, not just the cytoplasm, but also the interior of these organelles. It makes them uh, less acidic, meaning more alkaline. So it becomes more alkaline. And when it does that, it actually interferes with the, this process, number one. It prevents the fusion of this uh, cell, fusion of this um, uh, viruses, virus into the uh, cell membrane. So it affects that. So there is no entry of the mRNA if there is no fusion. Mm -hmm. okay. And then secondly, the acidic environment actually makes your enzyme inactive. So if it's not working, then you don't produce viruses. Okay, so uh, that's the second mechanism. Another way that HCQ works is that it makes the interior of this organelles uh, less acidic too. So when it's less acidic or more alkaline, there's no, there's, it would actually interfere in the production of your uh, viruses. So these are like your, uh, what do you call this, factories? So inside this organelles are where you produce all these uh, uh, viral parts until they're all assembled in this, uh, what we call uh, Golgi apparatus. So uh, it interferes with the assembly of these viruses. 
then um, the most popular mechanism of action of your HCQ is as a zinc ionophore, if you could see here. So zinc is a um, positively charged um, mineral. So it won't get into the cell easily because this is, um, um, well, the um, charge is neutral. So you don't, uh, zinc doesn't get into the cell. So you need something to facilitate the entry of zinc into the cell. And basically that's what HCQ does. Okay, so that's the fourth mechanism. And then finally, there's the, also, this is uh, actually the ACE2 receptor. This ACE2 receptor needs to undergo glycation for it to be active. So what HCQ does is that it prevents this final glycation, which is the addition of molecule into the final, into the uh, terminal amino acid of this uh, ACE2 enzyme. So basically the structure of this ACE2 would be uh, different. So the S protein in the um, virus won't recognize this ACE2. Therefore, there won't be any uh, binding. There won't be any binding there. So that's the mechanism of action of HCQ. Uh, it's not just a zinc ionophore, but again, it has a lot of like uh, um, mechanisms of action. So yeah, um, so doc, it's really more of a preventive, I uh, know. Yeah, basically, you gotta use HCQ early while the virus is still within the cell, because once it goes out of the cell, like what you see in those people with mo maybe moderate to severe symptoms, that it won't be useful, and that's why a lot of the studies that they did in hospitals, where it was given late as well as very high doses, they actually it actually uh, failed because they were uh, using it when the virus viruses have already escaped from the cell. So basically you gotta use it early uh, during mild and um, well, even asymptoma asymptomatic positive cases. Um, although there's a study done at Henry Ford Hospital in which they actually use um, HCQ even in those people with severe symptoms. And it was uh, based on that study, it actually decreased the um, uh, deaths by up to 50%. But the most important thing is to institute treatment early uh, while the virus is still within the cell. Because basically that, that's how it acts. It's all within the cell. Okay, and doc, uh, this is, uh, uh, there's no, pro uh, you cannot buy this over the counter, no? Uh, it's administered by doctors. Yeah, you have to get a prescription from your doctor, but first, uh, your doctor needs to know about this. Um, in some countries in Latin America and Africa, they're available over the counter because malaria is such a common problem there that they just made it available for the their population. And um, in countries like uh, India, I think they're allowing it, uh, allowing it in their uh, certain communities because, uh, again, um, malaria has been uh, endemic or um, really well established in those areas. That's why they allowed over-the-counter use. Okay. All right. Let's proceed. Uh and by the way, it's been around for 65 years and uh, it's being used by people who have uh, rheumatoid arthritis as well as lupus. So it's, uh, as it has a very good safety profile. Um, yeah, there are some questions, uh, there are other uh, concerns about it, like it may cause like heart issues, but it's been around for so long and cardiovascular problems has never been, well, it may have been mentioned before, but very rare. But um, this uh, concern about HCQ causing heart problems, uh, I think it's, um, uh, what's the right word for it? But anyway, uh, there are a couple of cardiologists in Texas who found out that 
HCQ even combined with this antibiotic um, azithromycin then cause what we call tersa de point, which is actually a cardiovascular rhythm problem. Okay, Doc. Mm -hmm. And this just the uh, summary of the mechanisms of action of the HCQ. And I hope I was able to explain this diagram uh, clearly. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So, um, in Manila, uh, do we, uh, I guess mo hospitals use this here, no? Um, I'm not sure, but I encountered some uh, doctors who have used it for their clients. Um, but I don't know it's, if it's part of the protocol of uh, hospitals around here. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, doc, Should it be the protocol, Doc? Should it become the protocol, Doc? Sorry. Uh, well, ideally, uh, but again, uh, this, there's just so much controversy regarding this medication. I believe it's been politicized, especially in the U.S. Uh, yeah, since um, uh, the POTUS uh, highlighted uh, the use of this uh, medication. Yeah. And uh, Doc? Uh, in your holistic medicine, do you uh, do you treat COVID patients, ba, or more of holistic preventive side ka lang? Yeah, I've encountered some people who uh, had positive uh, PCR, so I re I recommend the protocol. But again, um, I uh, educate them and tell them uh, basically what uh, possible side effects are and how how uh, you need to take it at a certain dose uh, just to minimize uh, any uh, untoward uh, side effects. Uh, and it's also part of my uh, holistic protocol. So I also combined it with uh, antioxidants because again, uh, if there's viremia already, um, you need to take antioxidants because the Viremia could cause excessive oxidative stress, which would cause cell damage. And um, this could also lead further into what we call a cytokine storm. So my approach is uh, more holistic rather than just uh, depending or relying on uh, medications. Sorry, but you have to treat it early though. Yeah, yeah. Um, the best thing to do is to treat it early so it doesn't get worse. Again, uh, if you get it at this stage when the virus is still within the cell, uh, you're going to get a better prognosis, uh, better results. Uh, all right. Uh, any more question, uh, Dito? Sorry, Doc. Just going back to what you uh, diagram on the, the ACE2, um, you said that the ACE should always be, um, is it working properly, Doc? Or, because I remember I uh, was taking an ACE inhibitor before and you told me to stop for my uh, hypertension. Is that related? Which one? Um, okay. You you mentioned about the ACE2. Is that an is that an enzyme again? Sorry. Yeah, it's an enzyme. And also oh, yeah, so works as a receptor for the uh, uh, SARS CoV 2 virus. Right. So Doc, if it's a receptor for the SARS CoV virus, I remember you said that because I was taking um an ACE inhibitor for my hypertension. And you asked me to stop that just so that I'm not susceptible to uh, picking up the virus. Is that, uh, is that the one that you were talking about before? Which one? The ACE2 and uh, yes. my taking of uh, the ACE inhibitor. Yes, yes. So Doc, sorry for for purposes of our listeners, um, can you explain why that is important? 
I, um, yeah, those with uh, comorbidities are more prone to uh, uh, get COVID-19 because of not just the, um, uh, the ACE2 enzyme or receptor, but due to other things as well. Um, in general, they have lower immune systems because of, again, um, medication, medication induced by depleting the body of certain nutrients. Mm. Okay. All right. Um, wow. This, uh, <laughs> this is a long uh, show, uh, but I guess um, it's very important. Uh, I think uh, Doc already answered all my questions um and uh what i got doc uh just to for to uh for prevention no? um so you can have preventive dose of zinc and uh quercetin uh, at least those two and vitamin yeah. d uh sunlight and of course vitamin c uh, Ikaw dito, ano na ba na tutunan mo? Yeah, me, um, I, I think uh, what I got from the, the show is um, uh, that we need to watch out for our gut health, our um, alkalinity, that uh, we should always uh, take alkaline-rich foods. And if we're able to get um, uh, supplements uh, that promote um, the healthy, healthy body pH, then we should get, get those. And, uh, of course, stress reduction. And you also uh, mentioned about self-care, Doc. So self-care is very important, especially now, no? Just so that yeah. our uh, immune system is strong. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. So uh, before we close the discussion, uh, there are no more questions, although we have a winner, I guess. So uh, we started this show with a call to action to comment. Um, <laughs> in the in the comment section below maybe dito you can uh so this oh, from okay. all right Christian. so uh, our winner for uh, uh the gd40 fora from psmc yeah uh, it's uh, the best in the market because of its hematic range which makes it compatible for different patient types I need a glucometer for my mom so that she can uh, monitor her blood glucose. Congratulations, Christian Valdez. So you won uh, GD40. Please uh, send us your address so that we can uh, send it to you via Grab. Hi, congratulations. Um, and uh, thank you, Doc Joel. Um, thank you, Dito. Um, and... I guess uh, we've learned a lot on COVID-19 um, and it's very uh, timely. Uh, at least it's direct from Doc uh, Joel, who is a uh, wellness doctor. And that's it. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I do hope those watching in the replay, you learn a lot from this episode. Thank you very much, Anton. Thanks, everyone. All right. Thanks, thank you. Thank you, guys. Uh, congratulations, Christian.